Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, once again, our conversation with three of our five regulars focused on how each of the businesses is coping with the crisis. This time, however, the conversation took an emotional turn when we learned that while all three of the week's participants had applied for government rescue loans, only two had been funded. This week's 21 Hats podcast lineup included Karen Clark Cole, who is CEO of Blink, a user experience research and design firm based in Seattle, William Vanderblumen, who is founder and CEO of Vanderblumen Search Group, a recruiting firm that specializes in working with churches and other faith based organizations, and Dana White, who is founder and CEO of Paralee Boyd, a chain of hair salons based in Detroit. As we discussed last week, William, who had already made the decision to reduce his payroll by 40%, was one of the very first owners in the country not only to have his loan approved, but to have the Paycheck Protection Program money land in his bank account. Karen, whose biggest client is Amazon and whose business has held up quite well, also got a loan. But Dana, whose hair salons are completely shut down, got nothing. In fact, she couldn't even get PNC, the bank that took her application, to respond to her inquiries. What's frustrating, Dana told us, is that I'm the minority businesswoman that they call when they want to talk about how they're helping minority businesses. I've done publicity for them. And crickets. Dana also questioned how it was determined which businesses would get the money. She told us, I'm talking about the people that if they don't go to work, the country stops. And I'm seeing that these aren't the people, the companies, the small businesses that got the money. The independent grocers, right? The hair salons, the small restaurants, they didn't get the money. Our hope is that business owners listening to these conversations will maybe pick up a few tips. But if nothing else, they will surely see that they are not the only ones fighting these battles. If you find value in this conversation, please know the 21 Hats is struggling with the crisis too. If you know a friend who might benefit from this episode, please share it. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Review us and rate us. It makes a difference. Also, this Thursday, April 23rd, we're doing a very special 21 Hats War Room. This week, my guests on the free live webinar will be all five regulars on the 21 Hats podcast. This is your opportunity to ask questions directly of Karen, Jay, William, Dana, and Laura. You can get the link to register for the webinar through our daily email newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, or you can always just email me, lfeldman at 21hats.com. That's lfeldman, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, at 21, the number two, the number one, hats.com. Before we get started, I'm here with Adam Witte, who is the founder and CEO of Advantage Forbes Books, which helps entrepreneurs write and publish their own books. Adam, I know you think all entrepreneurs should consider writing a book. Why is that? A book is the most powerful marketing tool in the world. It's a way for you to share your story and your company's story without anyone ever feeling like they are being sold to. It builds authority, it builds credibility, it builds expertise for you and your business. Adam, we're recording this in the middle of this unprecedented crisis. Is now a good time to write a book? Uh, Believe it or not, Lauren, I would argue now is a better time probably than ever before. Entrepreneurs and business owners have an unprecedented amount of time on their calendar that quite frankly, they did not think that they would have. We are working with entrepreneurs all over the world who are using this unexpected downtime to create an asset for their business that will pay dividends for the rest of their career. If someone does write a book, how will they know if it's effective as a marketing tool? They use a book as a sleuth marketing tool to generate new customers, uh, to advertise their business, and ultimately to help convert uh, prospects into customers. And for many entrepreneurs, a, a customer can be worth hundreds, thousands, even tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so one new customer into your business can more than pay for the book. Uh, Speaking opportunities, PR and media opportunities, those are some of the other benefits. I know a lot of entrepreneurs who've wanted to write a book and have never quite gotten around to it. How do you help somebody in that situation? We do our best to make it as easy and painless as possible. And we do that by first pairing you with a master book planner who spends some time interviewing you, and those interviews turn into a blueprint for your book. Then we assign a ghostwriter to work with you to ask you questions about that master book plan, to interview you. It's all done over the phone, Lauren, so it's super easy. Those interviews are then ultimately turned by the ghostwriter into the manuscript of your book. If someone wants to learn more, where should they go? We have a free copy of my best-selling book, 
titled Book the Business, and we're offering a discovery consultation to any 21 Hats subscriber that wants to learn more, advantagefamily.com forward slash 21 Hats. You heard him. Go to advantagefamily.com forward slash 21 Hats to get Adam's book and to sign up for your consultation. Now, back to the show. Let's start with our usual uh, crisis update. Uh, Karen, we haven't spoken with you in a, in a couple of weeks. I'd love to hear uh, what's going on at Blink, how you guys been doing. We're actually doing pretty well. Uh, most people are still working uh, from home. And we've had to lay off a few people who were um, – they were workers that needed to be in the office um, or in a couple of cases um, – workers who were doing a form of recruiting, which we're not doing right now for our research sessions because they were for live sessions. So for the most part, though, everyone's able to do their jobs from home. Certainly, there's an efficiency uh, difference, that's for sure. How so? What, what, what do you mean by that? For me in particular, I mean, it, what used to be a hallway conversation while on my way to get coffee, sort of multitasking, um, decision made or question answered. Now it has to be set up as an actual meeting um, blocked on my calendar. You got to log in, you got to be on video. Um, it's just, you know, my days are literally by the minute back to back all day long, all week long. And so then when I actually have to produce some work, some outcomes that's happening in the evening. So I've been working like uh, till 10 at night, most nights, even on the weekend. So it's been a lot, but I'm grateful that I have stuff to do. <laughs> That's for sure. So the business is held up. Yeah, we're doing we're doing just fine, um, and our clients seem to have adjusted as well, which is obviously the biggest, most important piece is that they're still willing to engage and do work and start projects and continue on with projects that they have going. So we've just switched to Zoom. We're even doing some um, sales training right now with uh, a third of the company all on Zoom, where it would be normally big in-person gathering, but it's all happening on Zoom and everyone's really adapting. Can you give us a sense of who your clients are and what kind of work they're hiring you for? You know, with the economy all but shutting down, uh, what's keeping you busy? Digital products. So uh, companies who, whether business is online, and in some cases, you know, like we do a ton of work for Amazon, they're our largest client, so they're busy. So I've heard. Yeah. And so, but a lot of it is working on their systems, um, new digital products, things like that. And so another example is, uh, you know, online project management, for example, like projects are still going, companies are still running. And so they still need the tools to run their businesses. And that's largely what we're working on is enterprise level systems um, or, you know, consumer products that are largely digital. Dana, um you obviously are not in as fortunate a situation with your business. Uh, your hair salon's completely shut down. What's going on with you? So it's been one of the busiest times for me as an owner because um, similarly to Karen, I'm working from the time I get up to, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. Um, the updates on loans and grants change hourly. Um, and the stipulations and everything change. So for me, between the webinars and, and the Facebook lives, and we're still just getting a ton of information. So I've been applying everywhere. I think I'm at my running total of 12, uh, like no, 13, 11 grants and, and two loans that I've applied for. Again, I'm still working on what the next iteration of Parley Boyd is, who will Parley Boyd be as we go forward. People are like, oh, are you dealing with the boredom? I'm not bored. <laughs> I've been working. I have not had time to sit down and read. I have not sit had time to sit down and, and cross stitch and do some of the other things I like to do um, because I've been in my email. Uh, strangely enough, people are applying for jobs. Interesting. Yeah. So we've wow, had- Wow, that's interesting. Are you finding people that you're interested in? Yeah. So I, we get about one or two applicants a day for various positions. Um, and that's somewhat comforting, um, but- Yeah, the, that's hopeful. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's somewhat comforting. Um, I, I don't want to lose any of my staff to this. I Like I said, I have a great team right now, um, but I understand, you know, we might. Um, so now it's just thinking about how do we open when we open? 
um, because I know if the, you know, the hold got lifted tomorrow, not everybody's running out to the movie theater or a baseball game, right? Um, and so I know people are going to come and get their hair done, but I still want to do it responsibly considering the fact that they haven't tested a lot of people. Um, and then just, you know, making sure I have enough staff to help with the demand of the people coming in. Um, so we might be doing some Zoom interviews. Um, I think when we do open, we may not open the day everything is lifted. We may take those couple days to, you know, get the staff together, have staff meetings, and then decide uh, the day that we're going to officially open. Dana, where do you stand with your uh, Paycheck Protection Program loan application? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not the response I was hoping for. <laughs> the PPP. Okay. So, you know, I I applied the night it came out, got booted off the system twice, um, couldn't sleep. So about 3.30 that morning, I did it and got through. Um, my bank has contacted me twice saying, hey, we need information on this. We need you to re-sign this. Um, and that's been it. Um, several business owners here, small business owners here in the Metro Detroit area are in the same boat. Um, we're a little disheartened. When we see that Ruth's Chris got $20 million, we're just really wondering where is help for small business and how does the government define small business? So I'm probably in that next round of funding. Um, but again, again, if they want to open in May, you know, that's a, a month from now. Right. And that stimulus package is going to take more than a month to get to us. So how do we get people paid prior to it? getting funded. So I don't know. I'm just like, you know, like Miss Seely in the color purple. I'm just sitting here waiting to see what color the wall is going to change next and seeing what happens. William, you uh, you stunned us last week when you told us that uh, you were, in fact, one of the, the first businesses in the country, I think, uh, not only to have your application accepted, but to have the money in the bank. Uh, what's going on with you now? I think we got lucky. My COO wrote an op-ed, was picked up by Religious News Service, about how churches need to hurry because uh, even if you get first in line, you might not get there. And that even if only 80 percent of just the small businesses applied, they're underfunded by a third, you know, 350 billion or whatever it was. So we just feel really fortunate. And uh, our clients are very grateful because they're the more common story is the one that Dana just shared. And uh you know, it's it's really unfortunate that it's been that much of a snafu for people. We've been uh, blessed to hear that that some of our churches, even really small ones, have gotten loans that have carried them through. I, I, I don't think, though, Lauren, you know, when we looked at the PPP, it's not the lifeline because, I mean, it is going to be a month. And we build things out, you know, over time. And if you don't sell anything in March or April, then we don't have income in July, August, September. So for us, it was a very important and, and we're grateful for it bridge, but it was not the total solution. And, and that's what led us to do some restructuring that, that some might deem severe, but we, we felt like it was uh, tempered with a lot of uh, thought and uh, careful projection. Have you decided how you're going to use the money? Yeah, I'm going to pay people. Oh, uh, right away? Or are you going to wait until the business uh, fully reopens? What's your thinking on that? No, no, our salaries continue. So, so we did a a weird thing. I mean, we've decided if our if our business were to die, we're going to die with our boots on. And right now is just not the time to sell at all. You appear completely tone deaf, particularly if you're working primarily with nonprofits and churches and faith based businesses, which is what we do. It just seems like, are you kidding me? We're out here trying to help the world, and you're asking for money. So. I told our sales and marketing team and the company wide, I'm like, this is the sentence I want you to memorize for March and April. Serve, don't sell. And I will pay you your salary to serve, don't sell. And that's why we poured, I don't even know how many hours into PPP webinars. And now we're shifting. Uh, I have an addiction. I should probably confess to the group. I am addicted to buying web domains. I might be single-handedly supporting GoDaddy right now, uh, and uh, we'll have um, opened reopeningthechurch.com and reopeningschools.com, and we're going to – I felt like after Easter, maybe it's because it's getting warmer here and flowers are blooming in Houston, but the, the 
feeling I have is that attention is shifting away from how do I wash my hands and how do I get you know this done and how do I quarantine to, all right, when are we going to reopen and what does a responsible reopening look like? And so, so I am literally paying my staff to do no billable work with the exception of finishing searches that we're, we're doing right now to serve churches and say, let's help foster the conversation about reopening. And we're betting big that that will happen before we're completely exhausted of options. We lowered sales projections, we lowered payroll so that we could make this work. But I firmly believe that if we can ride this out on the far side of it, people will remember the service a lot longer than they'll remember any sales pitch we'd do right now. William, what do you mean by lowering payroll? Is that reducing salaries or how do we mean? Yeah, yeah. So we went over a little bit of it on a call. I think that maybe um, you weren't on, but we basically said we looked at our projections. What that's going to mean if those are the sales projections. And the quick answer was we got to reduce payroll by 40 percent. So. I said, no more salary for me, done for the year. Uh, My lead team said, okay, we'll take a 25% cut. And then we, uh, the higher paid people in the company all took a 25% cut. Did you give them a choice? That's what they could manage or that's what you No, that was, that was, that's just what it's going to be. And if you need to leave, we totally understand. In fact, we had one-on-one conversations with all of them so that if one of them said, I really can't make that work, then that's fine. Go go where you need to, and then we can readjust the budget and maybe lower that number. But it didn't happen. Nobody turned us down yet, right? It, I mean, it's been, what, two weeks since we did this. So we were pretty early. The people lower on our pay structure, we just figured it was the money that we would have cut out of their salaries actually would make a bigger difference in their livelihood than it would in our bottom line. Like the proportions just didn't work. So we said no cuts for you guys. By the way, we're cutting everything by 40%. And we furloughed some people and we laid some people off. And so everybody that stayed actually agreed to take on more work for either less money or their salary, which is not what I would call highly compensated. So everybody took a hit. And I tried to frame it as I'm going to be the lead here and I'm taking the hit. And, And frankly, at the end of the day, Adrian and I are taking the hit as an S Corp. If we go under, it's us that goes under, not the folks working for us. Karen, uh, your business is doing well, but did you consider applying for a PPP loan? Yeah, we did, and we got one. Wow. Yeah, so the, it's, you know, I'm, I say we're doing well and that we haven't, you know, we're still working, but there are lots of financial impacts for us for sure in terms of we have 30,000 square feet of office space in Seattle alone, plus all of our other four locations. Um, And that rent is largely offset by what we call lab rentals. So it's renting our research uh, labs, which we have six of them in Seattle, and they're really big state-of-the-art facilities. Um, And we try to keep those busy every day, and those really pay the rent. Um, You know, we're in a, we're, you know, believe it or not, we're in a pretty low margin business as consultants at the end of the day. So there's not, you know, we have savings, but not a pile. So we have to be super careful. And so then with that being gone, it just starts eating, you know, right away into our, um, you know, as part of our revenue. So while the project work continues on for the most part, we've had some that are um, only a couple that are canceled and a lot that are delayed. So we're going to have a lot of um, deferred revenue. Um but there's other, you know, there's other things. Um, most people can't take their vacation. And so rather than lose it or, you know, accumulate it up and then not really be able to, I mean, people can't take months and months off at a time due to the project work. Um, what we're able to do now is buy it from people. And so that gives them a little bit more cash. Um, and it gives us, you know, the, the opportunity to, to, to acknowledge that they have vacation that they can't take. And so there's, you know, in, in my theory there too, is it's not, it's not life or death changes, but it's allowing them to, you know, get takeout from the restaurants more. So we're trying to use that, and encourage people to support the local businesses who are having a hard time. Um, so there's there's things like that. And then, you know, we've got a lot of um, interest payments at the bank and, you know, matching our 401k. And so we're just making sure that all those things are continuing to happen, um, whereas they we would have had to put a pause on most of that. Was there any question in your mind as to whether it was appropriate for you to apply or not? Yeah, I mean, it's designed for us to keep everyone employed and keep the company running, right? So that we can not have to lay anybody off. And so that's what we're doing. Um, 
And, it, you know, because if we if we continue to not have the income from our actual physical office spaces, we might have to shut them down. And so that's going to cause major problems in our business and have a ripple effect. So, the, it, you know, it's you, you show them all the finance. I mean, my CFO spent a lot of time present, you know, preparing all the financials so that you, you have to make a case for it with real numbers. So um, it's not really us deciding, honestly, it's them. Do you expect to uh, adhere to the guidelines so that the loan will be forgivable? Yeah, I mean that's why we got it is to adhere to the guidelines. So, yep, we're so. not. <laughs> you're adhering to some of them, but not a hundred percent, right, William? Well, we ran the numbers, like so. You know, I mean, this is rough math. It's more complicated and granular than this. But basically, if your payroll at the end of the program has matched what the payroll was they used to calculate your monthly payroll from last year, not headcount, just payroll then it's forgivable. But if you reduce payroll by a percentage, then you all, you're going to owe that percentage back to the government. And we looked at the numbers of what we would save through payroll costs, uh, through layoffs and furloughs, and what we would owe. And it was a no-brainer. I mean, it, we, we were like, well, a good bit of it will be a grant. Some of it we're going to owe. And by the way, we won't owe it for a year and at a very low percentage rate. And saving the money now, cash is king, seemed to be a better uh, splitting of Solomon's baby for us. Dana, wh what are you thinking right now? You know, I I have a feeling and I'm listening to the difference in between, you know, William and Karen's, Karen's story and, and Dana's story. You know, you hear, well, we prepared. There was no we prepare. Like, what is the definition of a small business? I prepared. I hmm. applied, Right. Um, you know, my business is shut down and I don't know what the government standard was. Um, I, I think everybody who got the PPP needed it in some form, but there are also businesses, you know, I've, I'm, I'm fortunate. I've gotten in about a couple of weeks, I've got about $10,000 in grants. Right. Um, so it's not like nothing's happened. Um, and then I'm with William, the, the, PPP wasn't my lifeline. I wasn't, oh, I'm going to get, it's going to save my business. No, it was, it was definitely a bridge. Um, but I guess, you know, you listen and, and you, you see companies that profited, right? And then the people in my circle are small business under a million in revenue and they didn't. Um, my, the companies that I'm speaking with, most of them don't have benefits packages for their staff. Right. Um, and so you just go, what is the plan? Right. What is the what is the genuine plan for working people? Not my, you know, and I'm not talking to people who can, you know, just now work remotely. I'm talking about people who make this country run, period. Talking about the people that if they don't go to work, the country stops and I'm seeing that these aren't the people, the companies, the small business that got the money, the independent grocers, right? The hair salons, the, the, the small restaurants, they, they didn't get the money. And that's my, it's not that, Oh, I'm mad that you guys got the money. No, no, no. Your people help. They do. Right. Um, but I, I have a staff that are single mothers, single black mothers, and who who are who are hard, who are hardworking, and having who didn't have the foundation to go to college, and are doing what they can, and and I'm up every night trying to help them, and I need help helping them, and I'm not getting it. I'm getting it from my community, like the Tech Town Stabilization, great, great. Um, the DEGC, which is a, a Wayne County grant fund. I'm, they're helping. They're stepping up and they're turning that money around quick. But when it comes to national leadership, I think I'm seeing, you know, we'll, we'll get to you. We'll, 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 we'll get to you, small business. And that's it. I, I don't want to sound like, well, why not my business? But a part of me is saying, well, when are they going to help the companies that didn't have a hundred thousand dollar profit or a five million dollar profit or who didn't have profit at all last year who can offer benefits for their staff and whose staff are some of them are the working poor and some of them you know uh, to me there's a there's a difference if you can work from home right now that it's different than those of us that well, not us because I'm working but 
for those that can't and that there's a huge disparity in what the definition of a small business is. And in my circle, there's a lot more me's than there are of them's. So that's it. I, please don't make it sound like, I, please don't hear that I'm, oh, you got it. No, but I'm just wondering the people that I'm seeing who who are closed right now and nobody's working um, at all. The only people who are working are the owners. I, I didn't see many of them getting the PPP. So I'm really hoping that they're going to make another stimulus package that's going to filter down to me. William, I, I don't think anybody spent more time trying to figure this out than you and your team did and trying to spread that knowledge to others to help others. Do, do you have a sense across the board? Do, do you have a sense of who was getting funded and who wasn't? Well, all I can speak for is the people we've worked with, right? So uh, the stories I'm hearing, churches are notorious for looking for the cheapest way out at, because they're nonprofits and they take up offerings from widows and people who can't afford it. So let's be careful with the offerings. And the stories I heard uh, that people that were getting turned down, down, down were the people that had switched banks every other year to get a quarter point off here or an eighth of a point better there or whatever the, the terms were. And then there's just good fortune. I mean, there were a lot of people lined up. Uh, That's I was certainly the case for us is having a great relationship with our bank. They helped yeah. us a lot. We and had I, a great I, relationship. I, My banker called me three days before the application came out. Chase, the people, Chase didn't even contact a lot of small businesses. They yeah. contacted them, but then dodged them. Is that your bank, Dana? No, PP, I mean, PNC is my bank. And my banker called me three days before. And she said, "These, this is everything you need to get ready. Um, Huntington Bank has been phenomenal with uh, the smaller businesses. I think Huntington Bank was very committed to getting Main Street businesses through the program. And there are some that did get funded. There are some, um, there are some that uh, got loan numbers, but no money. Right. And so I think a lot of it is good fortune. I have an excellent relationship with several layers at PNC, all the way from senior vice presidents down to my my local band, branch breaker. And I heard from all of them. Do you have an existing loan with them? I do not. But I've been banking. I literally walked my seed money into their bank uh, eight years ago and started my business. And they've known me ever since. It's also kind of personal with Maria, um, with her husband and her daughter, and she's she's a new grandmother. So I have a relationship, and that and that was frustrating is that I'm the the minority businesswoman that they call when they want to talk about how we're helping minority businesses. I've done pr publicity for them. I've they've done pictures with me and invited me to things, and that's how I've met some of the people in the corporate office at PNC. Is because hey, here's Dana and crickets. I have thought about switching to Huntington because my bank just wasn't working for me, but I had a great relationship with the people there. Um, and so now that this has happened, it's made me kind of rethink it. At least Huntington communicated with their people. They could pick up a phone. I emailed my bank people and she's like, Dana, we're, everybody's just out of the loop. Even in the email, could you re-sign the document and whatever you do, just reply and don't ask any questions. That's like literally what the email said. <laughs> it was like, okay, so... Yeah, I think it's I think you're right, guys. It's relationship. But I don't think the people that didn't get it is because of lack of relationship. I no, yeah. no, I, I don't think so at all. And that's horrible to hear. I, I Unfortunately, there are just way too many of those stories. I I, I, I hope that people here are, that this is there were way too many people and not enough. And maybe maybe more funding will come through. But uh, I will say if more funding comes through the credit that uh, like everything in my life, the credit for getting it done goes to my wife, mainly because her father, who's been in politics for a number of years, as soon as Congress passed it, he texted us and said, get in line now, because the, they are notorious for not getting it done right. And if you're first in line and you knock on the door every day, that's your single best chance to control your destiny. And even then you might not. In the time we have left, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh what you see changing here and whether you've begun to think about how life might be different once we uh, do emerge from this. Karen, I'm curious with you, you referred to the fact that, you know, your offices are not being used right now. Uh, it's your life is less efficient uh, doing everything on Zoom. But are you also learning a different way to operate? Do you think maybe going forward, you'll think you don't need all that commercial space? Uh, I hope not. <clears throat> I hope we don't get to that where people don't want to be together. 
um, having everyone in the office in a beautiful space for for us to work in and clients to come to is um, is uh, it has been really important so far. So um, uh, I hope not. Have you learned from anything else? Have you seen other things that um, you want to take with you on the other side of this? Well, I, I can tell you that some of the Zoom meetings that we've had with groups of people, you would think they wouldn't work, but it's, it almost works better because everybody is so focused on the screen in front of them that you really get a different level of interaction. So I think, I don't know, maybe there's more to that. Certainly, but, you know, we've we've got five offices and clients all over the world, and so we're used to being remote. But I think this is giving us more tools and more skills at doing that well and not, um, you know, jumping on the plane so often. So, you know, maybe we'll save some, you know, create a better carbon footprint by flying less and um, save a lot of money in doing that as well. But, yeah, we're checking in with our employees regularly. There's a lot of them. Um who are in, you know, who are not enjoying this, you know, they're in an apartment with a roommate and they're trying to work all day long and it's noisy and it's, it's really stressful. And then there's people who have kids at home and, um, they can't get any childcare. Um, and so they're trying to work and juggle all that. So it's, it's really stressful for a lot of people and not any fun. So I think, I think, you know, large, large majority of our employees are excited to get back to work and to get their usual support. And certainly they want to get their hair cut. I can tell you that I, I think Dana's going to be busy the minute this is over yes. and you better stay, yeah. you better stay open. <laughs> yes. Dana, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you know, I think most of us assume that when we do come back, it's not going to be like flipping a switch. It's going to be a gradual thing and they're going to, you know, they're going to be some changes. And initially we may all be wearing masks and uh, social distancing may remain in effect. W what are you thinking in terms of the early days? You, you obviously can't cut somebody's hair from six feet away. Do you see changes you're going to have to make? Absolutely. So I was on a call recently um, with someone that I didn't know had been a customer of Paralee Boyd. And she said, when it's finally time for us to reopen, I'm going to go to Paralee Boyd. She goes, the reason why I'm telling you this is because you are going to be jammed with people. You're the only walk-in only hair salon anywhere. And everybody's stylist is going to be booked and there's going to be no place they can go but you. So I have to keep my staff safe. Um, and I'll, we will probably have masks, um, de probably definitely have masks. Um, Got to be careful using gloves on doing hair because depending on the condition of somebody's hair, that could break their hair, uh, the rubber, you know. So we're probably going to take appointments or do what we call check-ins where people can, we'll do about maybe two to four check-ins every 30 minutes. That's where the lean manufacturing of my business has to really kick it up a notch where, where will these people be in the process that allows them to keep them at a, a distance from where the other people are going to be and then moving them throughout this process to get them in and out and under a certain time. So that's what I'm working on right now. Do you think you'll have to reconfigure your shops at all? Mm -mm. No, it's just because it's already designed to be lean. It's just uh, managing the stagnation. Just say, okay, these two are here. They've moved here. It's going to take them 30 minutes to get to this point. This is the point in the salon where we can get two more people in at this station and moving people. So they are not in close proximity all the time. And in order to do that, we can't let everybody come at once. We have to have people check in and do check-ins at, you know, uh, every 30 to 45 minutes is what I'm thinking. But if I just did walk-in, we'd have around, a line around the block at both locations day one. And I'm not going to do that. Right. William, you had an interesting uh, back and forth with Laura a week or two ago uh, where she was suggesting that she imagined that churches may go a little bit more digital after this. And you said you didn't really see that happening uh, because people have a need to be together. Is is that still how you're thinking? Yes, but I think that, uh, first of all, I think our work will become more necessary than ever. Uh, what what I'm noticing, and this is part of why we're building out the openingchurch.com and openingschool.com, is how do we foster a conversation, realize what's really out there, what what churches are doing right now, and I think this is true of nonprofits and schools as well, is making as much connection with people as possible. So the soft skills, relational intelligence, 
emotional intelligence, all of that is going to jump really high in the profile of the successful leader of a faith-based group in the next decade. And that's not something you can see on LinkedIn. You can't just do a resume search to see if that works. So I think that there will be uh, a combination. I don't think it'll be an either or. Do we go back to the old way or do we do all online? I think the interminable committee meetings that are during the nighttime where people have to leave their families and go up to the church, those might become Zoom things. Uh, I think some of the ministries that can happen digitally can happen. I think giving will be more digital. I do think the need to be together will still be there. I think what that looks like is going to be very, very different. For the last 50 years, it's been come to the church and learn something. Well, the idea of learning something at a location is over. I mean, it was over a long time ago, but now everybody knows. I mean, you can Netflix the best preachers in the world right now, and so to speak. So it it will, we will come together. It will require a different kind of leader. And on the school side, oh my goodness, a different kind of leader. So I think what we're trying to figure out is out what is our value to clients. And right now it's helping identify what's the profile of the new kind of leader in the new norm. And then how do you become the, the group that can help identify that talent um, quicker and better than anybody else? We've talked a little bit about Zoom. I'm curious, have any of you had any security problems with Zoom? Anybody been Zoom bombed? Yes, I have. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, we have as well. Yeah, it was bad. So the when they were getting all the uh, people together to announce the grant, they did it with Zoom. And it was full, you know, it was a minority call. Um, and so we got hacked full of um, Nazi propaganda, um, racist Confederate stuff, a lot of, you know, racial slurs being spit out, a lot of pornography um, and people just wouldn't get off the call. And I kept, you know, posting, you guys, we've been hacked, get off. Moderator needs to shut this call down. And so then I just got off um, and then they moved it. Uh, they moved it to um, a call. What happened to you, Karen? Uh, I, it wasn't me personally, but I know that uh, some Russians showed up in one of our meetings, and so <laughs> it was quite a while ago. Um, and so Did they we tell you who to vote for? Yeah, I'm not sure actually <laughs> okay. what happened, but it was quite a while ago, and so we uh, we just switched to having a password, and that solved the problem. Yeah, I, I, we had a lot of clients, Lauren, that are on free Zoom accounts. Again, churches look for the cheapest option. Uh, that unfortunately had uh, really, really bad bombings of their Easter services, like illegal graphic photographs uh, that were thrown up in front of kids that were trying to do Easter. And, and I'm yet to hear, and I'm sure it happens, but I'm yet to hear of anybody who's using a paid account and using passwords that's had the issues. All right. So here's a question that's of particular personal importance to me. Have any of you figured out how to get your hair cut? <laughs> yes. What'd you do, William? I, uh, so I get my hair cut every couple of weeks. I'm a little OCD about it. And uh, I, I, I called Caroline, who cuts my hair, and she works for a little salon that's three blocks from the house. And, of course, they're closed. And she said, I, she said, find some clippers. I went to Walgreens to pick up a prescription, and they were putting out a set of clippers. So I FaceTimed her, and I said, how are these? And she said, they're great. They'll work. They'll get you through however long this is buy them, take them home, and then FaceTime me with your daughters. So <laughs> to my two teenage daughters, one of them was the camera person, and the other <laughs> one was running the clippers, and it took an hour to cut my hair. Which, you let a teenage daughter cut your hair? It can all grow back, right? So <laughs> it can go wrong. But uh, I, I am doing quite a bit of video, whether it's media interviews or Zoom stuff or webinars. So it was getting pretty bad. And uh she, the haircut Caroline, we call her because we know lots of Carolines, walked me, walked them through every step. And, and in exchange, we let her uh, put it on her Instagram. So there are, all, <laughs> there are all these pictures of my head on Instagram with lines drawn about use clipper number one. So we could all go find that if we want to? Yeah, you sure can. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it turned out to be a win-win. And then we sent uh, Caroline and her husband a nice gift certificate for dinner. So, uh, but yeah, we, we actually have another uh, follow up FaceTime tomorrow afternoon to learn how to do the the very top of my head, which is a little trickier apparently. So we'll we'll see how I see how I look next week. Dana, what do you think? Is there something in this for you? 
Not at all, because Parley Boy doesn't cut hair. Right. Um, so for me, I've just sent away for, um, you know, the samples that I want to use for some of the products I want to start selling. And I've used them here on the house on myself. Um, and and I've done the best I can do with my hair because, you know, I'm not a hairstylist. I just own a couple of hair salons. So I just... Um, do uh my hair um at the house i did it actually right before i got on this call um and try out new things um is there an option though for you to be sending and selling products to your customers yes but i have to find the right products and you know i did send away for some products and i like some of them and i don't like other ones so it's a matter of which ones to go to and i wish we had an end date right i wish they said okay june 12th is when everything was going to go so you know at first it was april 13th so now we know that's not it now it's in michigan it's april 30th so now you know and and, and now we don't know so with everybody pushing 2 weeks out it just, I, I keep moving the line forward. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm just going to get started. And well, I've gotten started. Once I get my product in, I will start doing how to videos. And I also want to send an email to my guests when it's time to reopen about how to prepare to come to Paralee Boyd because we just don't want people walking in and say, this is, I haven't touched my hair in, in a month. And you go, okay. Um, but I do want to say this, like, kind of to circle back, if you don't mind, Lauren, to, what we were talking about before with a PPP. And I'm thinking, you know, I have to say that I just think that there are a lot of people out there who are not on the cutting edge of anything, right? They don't have a family member who can call them, but say, get in line. They haven't built a, you know, a multi-million dollar business. And and although they're smart, their access is limited, i.e. me, right? Um, And I think we're just all just trying to do a good job and just to stay in business and I just really hope that there is, uh, you know, somebody in on, on a national level that is, is that recognizes that and is willing to help. I want to challenge, you know, either one of you or both of you to say, OK, listen, how do I send the elevator back down? For example, William, what small business do you know? I'm not saying you didn't do it, but just my challenge is when you got that call, what small business owner do you know that you could have called and said, Hey, this might be a good time to get in line, you know, That's or, good. you know, just send that. Cause that is what we have to start acting like our governors. Our governors are not waiting to be told what to do. Small business owners can't wait to be told what to do. And I'm challenging the people that do have the access, the people that can get the PPP, the people who do have a CFO on staff, right, right now, to go to people and say, hey, listen, I just got this call. This is that and the other. Um, Hey, uh, make sure you include this. Send the elevator back down. That's what I'm doing, right? I have businesses that are smaller than mine that don't know what a profit and loss is. Right. And you go, okay. let me talk to you about this. And I think that's how it's going to get through. So that's all I'm saying is just try to send the elevator back down. And whether they get on it or not, that's not your issue. But at least you hit the button and, and it closed the doors and it went down. That is something for us to all think about. Uh, We are out of time, unfortunately. I do have a very special programming note. I just want to mention that on Thursday, this coming week, April 23rd at 3 Eastern time, we're going to have a special edition of the 21 Hats War Room webinar that will feature all five of the regular guests on this podcast. Uh, This will be our listeners' chance to see uh, which of us is in most desperate need of a haircut. We now know it's not William. Uh, I feel like... (laughs) I, I may be the winner on that one. Uh, we all will also get to see Jay Goltz's new quarantine beard, uh, which uh, I think you'll find interesting. And uh, everybody gets a chance to ask their own questions directly of Karen, Jay, William, Dana, and Laura. But for now, my thanks to Karen Clark Cole, William Vanderblumen, and Dana White. As always, I appreciate your transparency, your thoughtful approach to all of this in this really difficult time. Uh, Thank you. Be careful out there, everybody. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, we started the 21 Hats podcast to help business owners feel a little less isolated, to let them know they aren't the only ones fighting these battles. 
If you got something out of this conversation, please help us reach more people. Tell a friend, subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats. And let me know if you have a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. See you next time.